here we are. We're back for another podcast. I'm here with the big guy, Dr. Ivor Warlock, out there in Dillon, Colorado, in this podcast 124. And uh, we've got a neat little show lined up for you here today. We're trying to keep things up every two weeks for you guys. We slipped up last week, but you probably didn't even notice that. And if you did, well, curse us out on social media. That's what it's for, right? So we're just going to jump right into, unless you've got something clinical, anything cool in the office recently, anything that uh, you're seeing uh, repeated cycles of, because I always say things come in threes and they often do in the clinic. Like, oh gosh, another one of those this week. That's interesting. You see anything bizarro? Hmm, nothing super bizarro that I can uh, that I can really put my my finger on. We've seen uh, several cases of Halix limitus, which we may or may not end up talking about this podcast. Um, I've actually got a uh, one of those case in one minutes that I'm putting together um, on mm. a Halix limitus and stuff like that. So nothing earth-shaking that I can share other than, I believe we talked about it last time, I saw a gal with Horner syndrome, so. Right, right, the Horners, yeah. Um, that'll be interesting to see that when you put that one together. Um, though not gate-related, it is cool-related, and that's what we're all about, so. Um, yeah, I, could, I just continue to see and deepen um, my experiential database uh, uh, on uh, loss of uh, Halleck's dorsiflexion, ankle rocker movements, and hip extension, and impaired uh, pelvis neutrality mechanics. Um, I continue to see more and more of this and more nuanced variations of it. I think that's what's cool about practice is you get to see so many different varieties because you can have those losses of range of motion on so many different body types, uh, the, the mesomorph, the ectomorph, the endomorphs, and it presents differently in all these clients. I've got a, an ex-cross-country skier from Russia. He used to uh, ski for them in the Olympics right now. And, I mean, this lady is a bulldog. But um, it's interesting how they coached her and into some uh, amazing strength but in very poor patterns. And she is a mess now. She's in her early 40s and it's in a... It's an atrocious mess, if that's even great English or not. But um, she's a mess. She, she um, But, um, you know, cross-country skiing. Your skis, half the time, unless you're doing the, you know, the kind of the, the skating, um, are in a uh, straight line, you know. And uh, this lady has all kinds of torsional things. And they were just trying to find ways to coach her out of her normal anatomical torsional issues to try and get the... Um, um, the skiing mechanics better for her. And it was very difficult because she said, I feel, I always felt better in the skating part. And for those of you who aren't familiar with, you know, cross country skiing, there's that kind of skating part where they literally just, um, well, it looks like a, a hockey player skating down the, the, the ice where there's that outward push and they tend to jump out of the tracks and they tend to skate up the hill or down the hill or on the flats for more speed. And she said, I always felt so much more comfortable when we were skating. But when we they would force us back into the the uh, the uh, predetermined track, she said I would just have to struggle with my mechanics because my knees would want to go in, uh, and I could feel myself pushing outwards into my boots, and I could tell I wasn't flat on my ski. The poor gal, but she f- she figured out a way, and I guess she did very very well. I didn't ask for details, but she's clearly from Russia and clearly is a a, a physical specimen. That was a classic example of. People or coaches, in this case, not understanding torsional deformities and taking this athlete and just trying to push them to the limits, but in this case, uh, building strength into compensation patterns or non-natural movement patterns, which is something that you and I always uh, shake our heads at or our finger at. So I thought that was interesting. And of course, because of all those things, her hip extension was impaired, so she's got chronic low back pain, and she's got a a very well-ingrained um, sway back posture because that's where she was getting some of her hip extension from. Really quite amazing to see how she has developed even into her early 40s over, you know, two decades of skiing. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, I don't know if you've got any comments on that, but that certainly brought together a whole bunch of clinical issues for me. And uh, it was very fun to try and work through her problems and, or, and, and currently working through her problems. But we're making some headway here and 
there's a lot of conflict in our in our dialogue because she says, well, that's not what they told me. And I said, I know, but that's what got you into trouble. So we need to actually do this now. And she goes, that's just contrary to my thinking. She's very rigid in her in her ideals, but I think she, I think I'm getting through to her. So you have any comments on that one? Yeah, you know, you're talking about skate skiing versus classic skiing. And uh, skate skiing is more like skating, like a hockey player, and classic is where you're linear. And we see a lot of these folks, you know, living where we live. And gosh, I, I can't tell you, people that we see that have either, one, a significant degree of internal or external torsion, or two, people that have a significant amount of forefoot varus, um, these people just have a heck of a time. Um, with problems. We actually had one gal that we took care of. She had 40 degrees of external tibial torsion, if you can imagine. Okay. So her foot's out, jacked out 40 degrees. She's got like the total kickstand um, syndrome going on. So what we actually did is we have a, um, a guy that we were taking care of that was a machinist. And we actually had the machinist design a binding interface for her that actually allowed her foot to be in this externally rotated position. Now, the axis of rotation wasn't perfect, but it was way, way better, and she was able to um, ski classic. This is a classic gal, so in, you know, linear, in line. Able to ski much more comfortable with her foot kind of cocked out to the side. Um, so yeah, you see these things all the time, and these are things a lot of times like you can't fix with training, but a lot of times we can modify the boot, the footwear, or the ski to make it much more comfortable for the person. And if they're comfortable, a lot of times they're more mechanically efficient. And if you make them more mechanically efficient, then they're going to be better and faster and, um, you know, all of those, all of those groovy things. Cool. Yeah. Nice little, nice little uh, addition there. Thank you. Well, you know, I, I, I do my best. So I want to talk about... <clears throat> This article out of um, the mirror, swearing can boost muscle strength and stamina, scientists claim. <laughs> so I thought that this was well, pretty ahead. hilarious. Yeah. Um, as far as um, the, uh, the whole thing, you know. So the question here is they're saying it is because you're activating your sympathetics. Uh, maybe, but what about your limbic system? So when you, uh, yeah. when you activate your limbic system, we're able to actively more effectively, a lot of times, suppress pain because of all those pathways that go from the periaqueductal gray to the nuclear raphi magnus or you know, vice versa and come down and we've got all these descending inhibitory pain pathways. And that's one potential thing. And two, because you're activating the sympathetics, you're going to preload... Um, the muscle spindles in a lot of different musculature. So if you do that, it's going to make the person that much stronger, no? Well, that would make sense. I never thought about the limbic system, but of course that's a a big player there. Um, you know, when I um, I go down every, uh, I usually come home at lunchtime and I go down to the basement and that's when I do my 30 to 40 minute workout and I am a weak person a lot of the time and uh, I get down there and I will make every excuse. I will check all of the things in the basement that don't need checked, including light bulbs and the sump pump and everything else. And, you know, I'm down there to work out, you know, I've got weights down there. I've got my rowing machine. I've got some jujitsu mats. I've got some kettlebells and dumbbells and everything else. And I am finding every excuse. And I have this little dialogue with myself you know, and it's filled with cuss words about you're weak. You know what you're doing. I see what you're doing. And I'm having this conversation. If someone audio taped it, they'd think I'm absolutely nuts. But I am having a very, um, a very aggressive dialogue with myself, trying to convince myself that I see what I'm doing there, and I need to get to business here because I've got a short lunch period. But um, so I'm very familiar with this uh, self-induced swearing. Um, and and yet, when I see people out working out, I don't hear too much of that, uh, you know, self-induced cussing. But this was interesting, and I thought it was amusing. And I knew you'd take a little neuro spin on it, so that was pretty cool. Anything else? Um, no, that was all on that. I just thought it was kind of funny. Um, yeah. You know, we, we we did have that one out of one of my favorite um, uh, indexed um, pieces of literature, the New York Post. <laughs> talking about implantable computer chips controlling your body movement. And yet this is just another example of, you know, 
being able to modify motor activity. I, I was very happy to see that the uh, the chip designer was Arm Holdings, who I happen to own stock in. So I was like, oh, oh there maybe, you go. maybe that's a good thing, you know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, no cool. real rocket science here going on. Just basically talking about, you know, it's a very, very brief, brief article talking about this chip transmitting signals to possibly like something like a spinal cord stimulator. Um, it has overhead uh, sensors, shall we call them, kind of like if you do a somatosensory book potential, you know, you've got these little electrodes that are going to sc- record electrical activity over different parts of your brain, and then that would be able to translate uh, down. So anyway, interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly not, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, certainly not earth shaking, earth shattering. Yes. Yes. And, yeah. and, well, we've talked about, and not for us because we've talked about this stuff before and we've mentioned that they're used to, they used a implantable chip near the area of the brain, the motor cortex, and, uh, it would send a Bluetooth signal out to a computer and then from the computer back into the, uh, a chip down below the spinal cord injury level. But this one seemed like a more direct route right from the chip in the brain down to the spinal cord level. Uh, it wasn't uh, there wasn't a great amount of detail. Maybe this is just a, a, a reposting of the same type of technology, but it's also possible that they've got a direct route now. But um, I thought it was interesting because this stuff, I mean, there's more and more of it coming out, and obviously this is what's going to happen. So those folks who are quadra and paraplegic, uh, if they can stay healthy enough, we're going to see some opportunities that um, – previous generations didn't get to see and we're going to have people who aren't walking walking again which is fantastic i didn't mean to cut you off go ahead no you're totally good you're totally good so what did you think um, of the uh, exercise pill update in medical news today well i thought i smiled because we always say look as soon as there's an exercise pill the world is going to change dramatically particularly for those folks who can't exercise I've got a, a client who's got arthrogryposis, which is a, a terribly debilitating um, uh, genetic disorder where the limbs are malformed and um, can't exercise, can barely uh, ambulate well at all, uh, very little use of the upper limbs. And so exercise is off of the plate. And so the only thing that they can do is uh, modify diet, and, and that's about it in order to keep their you know, blood glucose and, and uh, body weight normalized here. But uh, certainly an exercise pill is going to change things. And someone has come up with uh, some more data and studies on this um, out of the uh, Salk Institute uh, down in La Jolla, California. And they've discovered a chemical compound that can activate a gene normally uh, normally stimulated by running. And the data in here was, was ridiculous. Um of course, it was in mice, and uh, we like talking about mice on this podcast uh, as opposed to humans. But hey, you got to start somewhere. What'd you think of the details in this, in the uh, the genetic testing and everything? You know, the only thing that was a little surprising um, to me was uh, first of all, they have this pill that gives people more endurance. That's the bottom line um, of the study. It uses, mm-hmm. it looks at different uh, expression of different genes, and they have this compound that they're calling. Uh, GW, it's GW1516, which is a chemical compound, and it activates a uh, another gene which is known for um, um, mimicking the beneficial effects of aerobic exercise, for lack of a better word. So what they did is they gave this to mice, and if you have a murine-based practice, this is very germane information for you here, but what they found is that the gene suppressed basically break down a carbohydrates. And we know that during exercise, carbs are your first source often that you're going to go to, um, depending upon intensity and, and things like that. You know, you, you break through your, for high intensity exercise, through your creatine phosphate stores first, and then um, your carbohydrate stores, and then after that, or unless you're training at a lower intensity, you train your body so to burn uh, fat more preferentially. They found that um, it interferes with carbohydrate breakdown. So basically you're forcing people into either gluconeogenesis of another sort. So they're either breaking down fats or they're breaking down proteins, and they didn't go into that. Um, but it was it was interesting in that they found that the gene did that. And for me, that was like, oh. And then they extrapolate that is that that's why some athletes hit the wall. They hit the wall because, one, the carbohydrates are being preserved because the brain is the most glucose-sensitive organ in the body being preserved for that rather than being used for muscular um, activity and they haven't trained their body, you know, 
efficiently enough to burn fat. So they hit the wall and boom, um, they're done with that. So there's an interesting quote here by Michael Downs. He's one of the guys uh, that's the author there. And he says, uh, PPARD or PPARD is suppressing all the points that are involved in the sugar metabolism in the muscle. So glucose can be redirected to the brain, thereby preserving brain function. So basically uh, shifting people over to more fat metabolism. So that was just kind of interesting. I think that, you know, there's over, according to this study, 975 genes uh, which are affected. So when you start doing the math, um, if we're going to start manipulating one or two genes, that's when we really start to have problems because, you know, one thing is often, you know, dependent upon another. So if we uh, just start altering one or two, what other sorts of genetic expression problems might crop up, you know? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. The numbers were huge, though. I mean, the researchers found that the mice that received the GW were able to exercise for around 70% longer than the controls before becoming exhausted, which was tremendous. I mean, uh, that's that's incredible. 70%. Well, think about what this would do for marathon runners and stuff like that, you know, if something like this actually came about. But then you have the whole question is yeah. like, well, is it okay to, you know, hack your metabolism to win a race? You know, and then we get into the whole, well, we should have two Olympics, you know, the Juice Olympics where everybody can use whatever sort of performance enhancing thing that they'd like. And then the Natural Olympics for, you know, the rest of the world. Um, anyway, I don't know. I just don't think that there's going to be a way to get around exercise. I think that you just need to do it and, uh, you know, stop procrastinating, get up off the sofa, put the Twinkies down, do what you got to do. Yep, you have to do it. And, um, you know, the benefits are, are and we're not going to make this a, you know, a, a Tony Robbins podcast here, but the benefits are huge uh, on so many different levels from depression and mental well-being to obviously metabolism and uh you know cardiovascular health and and all kinds of things so i mean it's something that we all should be doing every day and and that includes some aerobic stuff some heavy weight stuff uh and uh, some high intensity explosive work etc so i don't know it's gonna be interesting to see where this pill comes but uh, that could break that two hour mark for the marathon did you see how, how close did he be, he come? I think he he um at the, you know that Nike that special marathon. Yeah, there, I remember, but I, and I don't I remember. Think it was, was close, but it the, wasn't. Uh, was it seventeen seconds off or something like something that? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, two hours and seventeen seconds. Yeah. So, you know, and to be fair, they manipulated a lot of things there as well, from wind and, um, you know, the course. I guess this is one of the fastest course. I think they ran it over in Europe somewhere. If I'm correct. So, yeah. anyways, CRISPR. Just more on CRISPR. They're coming out with the same stuff, and uh, CRISPR was the uh, the gene editing. Um, uh, well, you, you know more about this. Go ahead and just talk about it for a second. It's just more 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 stuff to indicate that we're heading down this road. But nowhere sooner we're going to be starting to alter embryos. But they're certainly seeing more and more advances in it, right? Well, yeah, CRISPR is a, we'll call it an enzyme, which is used to basically selectively snip out certain portions of people's DNA. So it's an editor. Um, pretty soon there'll be an app coming out. Um, I wanted to talk to you about that actually after the show about my CRISPR app um, that I'll have. So you'll be able to genetically alter the person next to you as they're running. Um, it's just another you know methodology that you can... Uh, that you can utilize uh, to your advantage. No, but what it is is that they're just. Um, it was more stuff talking about gene editing, and that CRISPR is just not as accurate as maybe we thought it was. Um, we thought it was fairly accurate for being able to snip out specific uh, DNA sequences or you know amino acid sequences, and it's not maybe nearly as um, as active as or as accurate as we once thought it was. Yeah, but it's still early. And uh, we will see, but uh, these will all be in the show notes, by the way. So they will, uh, you'll be able to click on these articles and do your own homework on here. So right, and be, keep a lookout for the uh, yes. Gate Guys CRISPR app coming to you on, uh, on at the App Store. Yeah, S snip so out your torsions. I know we have an agenda, flat feet, and but I really <laughs> want to hear your thoughts. This was one of your posts that was just for me was like wow, and it was interesting because I was going to give a talk. Um, to a group of folks um, about 
hallux function and that kind of stuff. So your medial tibial stress syndrome and long flexor of the big toe. Why don't you just give folks an overview and uh, kind of what you're talking about, and then if there's anything left for me to talk about after that, I can uh, I can add that. But I, this was just, I mean, you know, when I saw it, I was like, duh, of course, you know, wish I would have wrote on that. Uh, but anyway, go ahead. Well, um, you know, these, you know, I always give whenever I write something. I mean. I th- it's kind of a collaborative effort in my head because we've we've touched on these things in one way, shape, or form or another, and so uh, these things don't always come just to me. So um, I'm giving you equal credit here because this is a team effort on just about everything we do. But medial tibial stress syndrome, we wrote about this. Uh, let's see, the week right now is the 19th that we were recording this of May, and uh, I think two weeks ago, if you go back to our blog, somewhere around early May, it's May second. That article, May yep. second. Okay, there you go. May second, medial tibial stress syndrome. So the article uh, we put that in, in in there, and and then I just went off on a dialogue because as we as we usually do, an article or a piece of research comes out with some thoughts on and some hypotheses and some suppositions, and I thought, well, I don't know if they've got it all the way correct, but I respected their results, and they are what they are, and the results said that in this study, the the uh, mean uh, torque at the first metatarsal phalangeal joint <clears throat> plantar flexion was significantly higher in runners with a history of medial tibial stress syndrome than without it. Our results suggest that runners with a history of medial tibial stress syndrome adopt a strategy of reducing the load to the medial tibia because of their history of medial tibial stress syndrome. So I tend to... Um, I tended to maybe disagree with that a little bit. I thought, you know, they were they were suggesting that reducing the load at the medial tibia was because they were utilizing the long flexor in a unique way or unloading it, if you will, um, and going into the long flexors of the lesser four toes as a strategy. So they were suggesting that it was occurring because of the aberrant loads from the uh, the long flexor to the to the big toe the halysis uh, flexor halysis. Uh, I my, my, what I see in my clinic whether it's right or wrong but what I see is a lot of these clients who have that medial tibial stress type phenomenon tend to be one of two classes of folks they tend to either collapse into pronation and not control it really well and in which case those people tend to not have great tib posterior activity. They don't have great pronial activity. They don't have great anterior compartment endurance and strength, meaning the tib anterior and the long extensors. So they can't really get into a stable foot. We've talked about this in previous podcasts where the foot has to be stable enough in order to give enough ankle mobility, in order to have enough knee stability, in order to get enough hip mobility. And so you get these staggering shifts. And whenever the foot isn't stable enough, you're going to knock out ankle mobility so now the ankle, <coughs> excuse me, the ankle mobility drops off, and now you get into loading up above that, which is into the tibia, and I think that's the response. But back to these two people, you, you or two types of clients, you either get the client who has the collapsing phenomenon and can't control it, or you get the client who is aware of it and tends to move more into supination and lateral foot weight bearing and tries to get around it. I think that's the category that they may have been suggesting. But I've noticed that a lot of these clients will overutilize the long flexor of the big toe and often the flexor digitorum longus, the long flexor to the other toes, in order to create some gripping or hammering effect that does add, although inefficiently or um, uh, let's just say inefficiently, some uh, arch stability, which is not optimal. And I think that in itself is the strategy around it. And I think that's why you're getting the aberrant flexor halysis longus load because it's just simply a strategy. And they talked about fascial planes and tugging on the, the, tibial, um, the tibia fascia and some of the posterior compartment fascia as maybe a, a causative agent or, or a, you know, a factor. But I think the flexor is purely, in my opinion, a, a strategy and not the problem. So what did you think? Well, a couple things. Um, one, th- 
think closed chain. So the flexor hallucis longus, yes, it flexes our big toe. But when is it active? It's active from pretty much initial contact through a little bit past mid stance, but not quite the terminal stance. Okay, so its job, in addition to stabilizing the hallux, in addition to, you know, limiting hallux dorsiflexion, in addition to controlling dorsiflexion of the great toe, is to help limit some degree of pronation. And the flexor house, as we know, comes um, under um, the foot um, at the, you know, the medial, um, um, uh, the medial malleolar area, but. In the posterior compartment, it's actually quite lateral, so it's coming across the foot, and it gives it more of a mechanical mm -hmm. gives it more of a mechanical advantage. If we think of this from a closed chain perspective, now the big toe is anchored, and it's pulling back um, on the fibula. And if we resolve that moment, and we do not have um, appropriate mechanics occurring um, in that foot, that's going to assist in basically causing increased medial knee fall. In other words, the knee is going to move more to the inside, okay? particularly people with forefoot varus, uh, people with too much midfoot pronation, too much, people with you know, too much calcaneal eversion, et cetera. And, and at that point, it's going to be, one, you're going to try to use that flexor and recruit it during that second part of the gait cycle, because you know, we were talking about when it was supposed to contract, not when it's actually contracting. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to try to right. use that to shore the foot back up, decelerate some of that over pronation. It would be really of interest if they would have looked at in this study, one, you know, what was these people's arch height or did they have an increased navicular drop or something like that. And I'm willing to bet that this correlated more with people that overpronate through the midfoot than not. But it's purely mechanical ph phenomena and Wolf's Law because you have all this medial knee fall. Now I have increased stress on the tibia, you know, just because of resolution mm -hmm. of ground reactive forces coming through. And um, it was just, it was fascinating because you see so many people with overactive uh, long flexors in general and a dominance of this muscle. And when we look at this muscle closer, one of the things we notice is that it pushes the first metatarsal phalangeal joint axis dorsally and posteriorly, which actually limits dorsiflexion of the great toe. So if I'm limiting dorsiflexion of the great toe, now I have to have some other strategy to try to get over that foot and mm -hmm. push forward. You know what I mean? I nicely said, yes, yes, I didn't think of that. Yeah, so anyway, that was, I actually talked about your paper <laughs> at, uh, at this lecture that I was at. I was teaching a dry needling seminar, and we were doing uh, some stuff on the foot, and we actually, you know, had a discussion on this with uh, dorsal posterior motion and stuff. And so I just, you know, I thought it was brilliant. So thank you for putting that out there, because it really made my brain work in, in different ways. Well, it's like, well, of course that that's what's going to happen, you know? Um, but anyway... Yeah, that one took me a couple of days to kind of put together because like you, um, it sounds like you had the same thing. Your head started swimming with all kinds of ideas because there's multi-level mechanics here uh, from multi-joint to multi-muscular uh, tendinous, you know, and directional pulls and whatnot. And I don't even know if I got it right, but I think I got it at least on on the map. And I think it got people, at least I hope, thinking. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, it tickled your fancy a bit there. But, uh, you know, I do see a lot of these, I mean... What's the joint that goes sour that has the most pathological effects to someone's gait? It's that first metatarsal phalangeal joint, the bunion joint, the, the big toe. And, man, if you don't get the mechanics at that joint right, you get, you know, the, the lateral drift. You get um, splaying between the first and second metatarsal heads. You get the sesamoids not resting on the ground. So you can get sesamoiditis and then dysfunction of the flexor, ha flexor hallucis brevis. Then the arch gets distorted and there's a torque there and you can create an ab aberrant forefoot posturing where that forefoot bipod doesn't correlate well with the rear foot monopod. So what I'm saying then is that the foot tripod gets screwed up. And so many people, <clears throat> and we could see this, you know, let's go full circle back to the the video that has gotten um, just tons of, you know, hits over over the years that it, restoring the foot, the extensor hallucis brevis exercise with the yellow band. Go back on YouTube and look at the uh, type in restoring the foot or restoring the big toe. I can't remember what it was, but if you can't get into that balance of long flexor, short flexor, um, long extensor, short extensor relationship around any joint, but particularly this joint here, 
in an environment around a neutral foot, meaning neutral arch, neutral rear foot, neutral uh, talus, neutral uh, ankle mortis, you don't have a you don't have a chance in hell of getting your mechanics right, and everything after that is going to be a compensatory response all the way up into the hip. So, um, you know, it, 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 this is such a tricky area, and I am still learning because so many people come in with different other factors, torsional factors, weaknesses, step width, step length, foot types, um, pelvis mechanics that send this thing down a rabbit hole. So I still struggle with this joint. And if you, any of you listeners are struggling with it, you are in good company. Um, it, uh, there's still a lot of head scratching that goes on in my clinic. So um, I may talk a good talk sometimes, but I am still a student at large. So, Well, you got to learn from so your I'm glad patients. you enjoyed that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's where it happens. And, and if you're trying to learn off the Internet and then just coaching people through mechanics and you're not even taking off their shoes and their socks and, seeing how they move, let, <coughs> let alone how their biomechanics are, man, you're playing with a, a couple you know, sandwiches short of a full picnic, that's for sure. Wow, I've never heard that before. Yeah. You never heard that insult? No, I, I, yeah, I, I kind of like couple, it, though. I mean, I heard a, the tar- sharpest tool in the shed and the brightest crayon <laughs> in the box and all that, but I've, I've never heard a couple sandwiches short of a full picnic. I like that. I'm going to have to start using that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all. That's up your line. That's for sure. Definitely is. All right, I got hey, another thing here. Talk about. I'm sorry. Go talk ahead. about shoe drop because this was this was good. Oh, all right. Yeah, all right. Dress, I was going to talk about was important. something else. So I'm going through putting, trying to put something together on something else for a post because um, we had that talk this week. And if you haven't had a chance, go back and listen to uh, Biomechanics 312 on uh, onlinece.com. Give it a week, though. Actually, by the time this is out, it'll be out. Um, and it'll be live. But we really had a great session the other night comparing walking gait and a running gait. So I was doing some some research for that particular one. I came across this article in European Journal of Applied Physiology um, looking at shoe drop having the opposite influence on running patterns when running over ground or on a treadmill. So basically what they did is, you know, they're talking about minimalist shoes and the amount of drop. And that minimalist shoes... Um, have less drop. And that's true, but minimalist shoes are so much more than just having, you know, a different drop. It has to do with the structure of the shoe. It has to do with the thickness and the amount of padding. Um, there's just uh, so many other so many other factors here. But anyway, um, they took 12 guys, okay, so a small cohort, right, with different drops, uh, 0, 4, and 8 millimeter. And they put them on a, a treadmill, and they also had them run over ground. And they had them run barefoot as well, and they looked at vertical ground reaction forces um, as well as lower uh, limb kinematics, in other words, joint flexion angles and stuff. And what they found is that barefoot running had higher loading rates during overground running than the highest drop condition, while during treadmill running, it had the lowest ro- loading rates you know, vertical ground reactive forces. And they talked about the flexion, um, knee flexion and plantar flexion angles at the touchdown being higher in treadmill than overground, which is not surprising because the ground is moving um, on a treadmill. Um, but barefoot didn't really show any difference between the tasks. So it just, it, it really made me think about, you know, that. So eight, first of all, eight millimeter drop is not a big drop. Um, no. The typical like Brooks Cascadia is like 14 millimeters. And I would call that a fairly typical running shoe. Um, as far as that, so eight millimeters is not a not a huge drop. I mean, I'm sure in the full study, I only read through the abstract um, in this particular one. But um, as far as uh, the um, what's the word I'm looking for, the actual shoe that they were using in and what the torsional characteristics were. So, but but what did you think of this? I was really surprised. I was surprised too. Um... It almost made me wonder if the study, I almost want to see more studies on this to see if there's some correlation. Uh, I, I really don't know what to take from it. My head was still spinning. I didn't get to reading that until just about 20 minutes before the podcast here. Uh, I heard you talk about it the other night on the on the, uh, the lecture, and I meant to get to it, but I forgot. Um, you know, my, th- my thing has always been that, I mean, think of a, a, a woman's high heel shoe. You know, let's talk about a, a you know, a three-inch heel or four-inch heel. 
I mean, that postures you up onto the ball of your foot, and that changes your your ankle into plantar flexion. Um, it puts your hip into hip extension and in, into sway back posture, and you know the chest goes up and the butt goes out. All the things that a high heel shoe was designed to do um, for a woman's posture. And um, <clears throat> you know when you take that heel off immediately, your posture changes. The heel goes down. The body puts a, a it goes through a multiple level change of the center of mass. Uh, you start to distribute a more posterior center of mass. Uh, your, your, your glute becomes active again. So uh, your lower abdominals become active again. So <clears throat> I don't know what to think of this because I always thought that a lower heel drop shoe with, or even barefoot if you will, let's just stick with a lower drop shoe, was the way to go. But this has got me string, uh, scratching my head a little bit. Um, do you have a conclusion for folks other than, you know, do what's best for you? Well, no, not really. I mean, one, small sample size, one, few different drops, two, we don't know anything about stack heights. Um, you know, there's just a lot of factors here that were not discussed. Um, and the fact that in their conclusion, they say shoe drop appears to be a key parameter influencing running pattern but its effects on vertical ground reactive forces are going to differ depending upon the task. So, um, you know, I'm I'm really not sure. It was just, it was interesting. You know, there's theories uh, about that. So basically what this is saying is running on a treadmill barefoot gives you less vertical ground reactive forces than running on the ground uh, barefoot. You know, and then the opposite is true. Um with, uh, you know, running on a um, treadmill with shoes with uh, at least an eight millimeter drop in there. Yeah, I think we're going to have to wait for some more literature on this, but we'll, but we'll put this one in the show notes so you guys can, you know, go through it. And it's certainly up on our website and up on social media. So <clears throat> well, chime in, please. G- give us your thoughts. Well, it, it makes me think, you know, so when we're looking at vertical ground reactive forces with barefoot running, because we've talked about this lots of times, and we've talked about it in our barefoot lectures on online CE, as well as, you know, posts and stuff like that that we've done, you know, barefoot running is supposed to reduce vertical ground reactive forces, you know, whether it's on the treadmill or whether it's overland. That was, you know, that was the argument for a lot of these. Um, although I'd have to say, thinking back, and of course this is out of memory, most of the stuff I have seen on barefoot running all has to do with treadmill running. You know what I'm saying? All the studies are yeah. done on a treadmill. So gosh, that really yeah. makes you think back about the research there, and we're doing everything on a treadmill, but it's like, well, that's not real world, man. It's like, you know, it's yeah. different on the table when you're laying down than when you start to put gravity in the vestibular system in the picture. Um, so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I'm going to have to do a yeah, search what, now on overground or overland running barefoot and see if there's been any like, you know, indwelling EMG studies or anything like that that's been looked at to look at those loading rates because that would it's really... It's almost impossible to test though. Yeah. Well, I mean, sure, it could be it could be possible to test. You have to pick a couple. You could use intramuscular electrodes, um, which is what's done, you know, with some of the the studies in certain muscles, and we can measure that, or we can measure, you know, tension in Achilles tendon. It's going to require some kind of a remote unit because you're doing overland running, um, and it's going to be hard to control certain variables. Whereas a treadmill makes that, but treadmill's not real life. Um, yeah. So it really makes you look back at all those studies that are talking about decreased ground reactive forces with barefoot running were they all done on a treadmill you know yeah yeah was there enough caveat saying look but this is just on a treadmill or not and regardless you know where's the data that's more normative or more real world if you will yeah i don't know I, uh, this this was this was a little bit of an earth shattering thing i had to read it a couple times because i'm like wait, wait a minute what did that just say so i don't know yeah it was it was interesting and, and there's not a lot in the literature about drop shoe drop you know, a ramp delta, um, as far as mm-hmm, in the research mm-hmm. studies, at least that I could find on, you know, a couple quick PubMed searches. Um, cause of course, once I saw this, I'm like, and you know how it is, you end up going down another rabbit hole and you get into the mm-hmm. rabbit hole and then you realize that there's a fork and you're like, uh, do I go on the right <laughs> fork or the left fork, you know, and then that has another fork. Um, and that's just the way it is. Um, and it, it, interesting yeah. too, cause I'm, I was just looking at the, uh, you know, the website cause they always give you all the stats and, uh, 
only 646 people downloaded this article. It doesn't tell you how many read it, but that's not a lot. Yeah. No, no. There's, there's a, a sparse few out there that even probably found that interesting. You know, that's, that's that whole belief system. You know, don't disrupt your belief system. It might just change everything that you, you think and know about. And some people just don't want to go down that way. It's easier just to stay in your bubble. Yeah. So anyway, I'm but, sticking uh, with that, not necessarily minimal, but I like a midfoot strike. I like an increased yeah. cadence. I like, yep. you know, a shortened step length. So, and I'm sticking with that, you know. Yep, and a, and, and, a, and a slight increase in step width if you are finding yourself getting a little too narrow there and getting too far on the outside of your foot. That seems like a, a safe prescription, doesn't it? Well, it does, I, although I hate to genericize, but um, yeah. it, it, it really does. And run your arms at the side rather than across your body, which is going to move your center of gravity. It's going to actually put it more... Um, well, it's going to put your weight over your feet differently and move it slightly laterally as opposed to having it across midline. Um, so that that's one thing we find when we have crossover gait. The first thing we'll do when we're trying to, you know, we're giving them hip training exercises and stuff, but these people have, you know, recalcitrant, miserable knee pain and patellofemoral tracking issues and first ray issues. Just running those arms at the side rather than across the body, that's not the long-term cure, but it's a help. And it gets them out of that pattern and helps them to resupinate just a little bit better as they're coming through the second half of their gait cycle. And that makes them that much less symptomatic. And then we can start to work on some of the other, some of the other stuff that's going on. Yeah. It's certainly, uh, you know, what we just put out there is certainly a nice safe prescription for what we think should be pristine and, and normal or, or most uh, effective across the board. But most people don't have one, the biomechanics to do it, two, the ability or the awareness to do it. There's too many deeply embedded motor patterns that are inhibiting that process. So, you know, it'd be easy to for someone listening to this podcast going, okay, I'm going to write down those six things and I'm going to go and change all the things about my gait towards those six things. Well, good luck. You might have some new problems. You might have some new pains. Uh, it might help in some areas and it may inhibit in others. So if it was that easy a game, we wouldn't have jobs. <laughs> All right, so I want to hear so your take on this uh, effect of steroids on knee cartilage. Yeah. This was another one of those studies that you kind of like, I always kind of thought that, you know. But anyway, it was at a yeah. JAMA um, most recently here, yeah. and uh, it came out in 2017, so it just, uh, just came out. Yeah. Um, but anyway, go ahead. Yeah, it's... It, it blew up the Twitterverse and uh, JAMA Journal of Ameri- Journal of the American Medical Association. So we're talking about the uh, the king of the hill here, um, at least in some people's eyes. And uh, this says here the effect of intraarticular uh, triaminoclone versus saline on knee cartilage volume and pain in patients with knee osteoarthritis. A randomized clinical trial. We will put the link in the show notes, but. Uh, the bottom line on this was it might not be such a good idea. We're not sure, but it might not be such a good idea. And maybe continuing to squirt cortisone into these joints might actually be attenuating the cartilage thickness. Um, you know, the people get these things. I always to explain, you know, cortisone shot like a liquid mop. You're gonna, they're gonna go. You're going to go in there. You're going to... Stick it in the joint, and they're going to put some lidocaine or marcaine or something else in that thing to try and numb it up. And basically, it's going to go in there and just going to thin out all the tissue and, and uh, get rid of some of the inflammation. Yeah, there's some lies in that thing, but clients tend to get what it is, what, what I'm talking about here. It's to sop up some of the thickness of the tissue and the inflammation and to expedite some, some type of a change in the cellular metabolism to get some of the inflammation to die down. This, this uh, article seemed to suggest that uh, repeated injections actually um, didn't do a heck of a lot in terms of patient's pain, and it actually, the uh, over the long term, tended to thin out the cartilage a little bit. And there was a video that went with this as well, kind of uh, synopsizing things. But what um, what did you take from it? What did you think? Well, first of all— Because it sounds like your suspicions, your suspicions were just like mine, it sounds it like. It did not thin out the cartilage a little bit. <laughs> It thinned out the cartilage yeah, like fifty <laughs> percent. I consider that more than <laughs> just a little bit. Yeah. Um, then you know, then saline, and uh, 
you know, th- not that I see or I actually have to say I don't send people for cortisone injections into a joint other than if it's a short-term gain because they're going to be having something else going on, you know, like a surgery or something like that. But I generally try to discourage that. Um, I've seen a little bit and heard a little bit of data talking about stem cell and PRP and things like that, utilizing intraarticular injection and actually seeing increase in cartilage thickness. But I'd have to admit my my uh, literature reading on that particular subject is pretty limited um, as far as what I've seen. There's a few studies that support it, a few that don't. But yeah, um, and this wasn't like a small study, 140 people with symptomatic OA of the knee. So not an enormous study, but certainly not a small study. Uh, it wasn't like you know the last study when we were looking at running stuff where there's only 12 people. And it had n- no effect on the knee pain over two years. Well, duh, why would you keep doing it, man? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The sample size was 140, and it was a 50 percent reduction. Now that I'm looking, at yeah, it. it's it. That's crazy, that's crazy. But yeah. but anyway, I mean, we we yeah. see lots of people with knee OA, as I'm sure you do, and you know we're yeah. able to mitigate and manage their knee pain through, um, you know, altered biomechanics or changed biomechanics through acupuncture. Well, you know, which we use, of course, a great deal. Herbs. Uh, dietary changes, which has probably made the hugest difference, you know, taking people off nightshade vegetables, stuff like that. Get on a anti-inflammatory diet, cut down on the sugar, you know, all of those things that you talk about really makes a huge difference. And we haven't necessarily seen changes in cartilaginous thickness um, as far as that goes if we shoot x-ray. But what we have noticed is that people have much less pain and an increased range of motion objectively. So those are great parameters no matter what the joint looks like. Yeah, you know, it's really about the loading response, and um, <clears throat> you've got to figure out a way to get your client, whether it's a tendon problem, a joint problem, a, a multi-tendon, multi-joint problem. You've got to figure out a way to get that client to be able to load that area so that you can get some strength back in the system, so that you can gain some tolerance and stability to the joint, so you can get some of the pain down in the areas where the problem has been rooted. And if you can't get your client to load in a pain-free way, you're stuck, and that's where these are the clients that tend to... Well, I wouldn't say these are clients that tend to get the injection. A lot of those clients are going even far before they've even tried those things. I mean, it, it's usually injection first, then maybe rehab, but uh, which is backwards. Uh, but uh, it's about trying to get them into a normal, uh, a healthy loading response. And uh, we've got an article here on Achilles tendon loading and walking, which we'll talk about in a moment. And, uh, you know, I'm doing more and more of this loading um more careful loading of my clients, trying to find a way to get them to load a painful tendon, a painful joint in a manner where it is no longer painful, but I can get a load back into the system that can help them stabilize the joint so that I can maybe get that area or that muscle a little bit stronger so that maybe I can get a better loading response in time across the damaged area or the inflamed area. And it's really, I think that's simple. People are trying to make it a little bit more complicated than that. You know, there's a mnemonic or a saying out there that everybody's using now. It's called just load it. And I don't know who is responsible for that, but I'm going to hunt them down and give them a pat on the back because I think they deserve a lot of credit and a lot of recognition. But um, as I recall, I think the guy wrote a whole article or a whole blog post on the concept of just load it and load it well, load it pain-free, load it often. I mean, every few hours, I use the analogy, if you're going to take eight Advil in a day, you don't take them all at breakfast and you don't take them all at dinner. The smart person takes them throughout the day. Although I would argue that the smart person doesn't take eight Advil. But my point is that they take the medicine throughout the day. So if you find a, a manner of loading a tendon or a joint or a muscle or an area and you can get a good loading response out of it that gives you a half hour buffer of your pain, then you should be loading it like that every half an hour to an hour to every two hours or so repeatedly throughout the day to try and get a uh, one an inhibition of some of the, the nociceptive process but to get that tendon in that area to start to load more frequently so that you can actually start to develop one a new neurologic pattern but two a more appropriate way of helping that client find a neurologic pathway to load it in a more in the more appropriate way so I think I'm getting a little word salad here, um, but I, I think you can, hopefully it's coming across. What I'm trying to say here is that 
loading appropriately and often and pain-free is the goal of most therapy. You, do you know what um, triamcinolone acetinonide, you know, the, the thing that they inject the neos, do you know what that is? No, it's, no, I do not. Have you ever heard of the drug nasocort? <laughs> I have. You know what it's used for, allergic rhinitis, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So the reason I think they picked it is is because the acetinide, which is the ending on it, m- makes it much more potent. It's about eight times as potent as prednisone. And maybe that's why they knew it. But how did they get from the nose to the knee? That's what I want to know. I, I really want to know that, you know. Um, and I guess we could probably count on the manufacturer of, of this drug probably not wanting to sponsor one of our podcasts because of the negative publicity that we gave them today. <laughs> anyway, we are at about an hour. Do you want to talk one more or do you want to call it? Well, yeah, that was an interesting study. I'm glad we talked about that. Uh, we will actually, um, yeah, you're right. We're at about an hour here and um, I think we'll just move this Achilles uh, tendon loading one over to, since we just t- kind of talked about the concept anyways, we'll move it over to the next podcast and we'll go from there. Um, hey, we've got some exciting new stuff that may be happening here in the next the new year. I guess we shouldn't get too excited or mention it but uh, we may be doing a lecture we're not going to say where or when but um we're excited about it and we're in talks with uh, a group right now that uh, wants us to come out there so and we've also got something even more exciting um Ivo and I are gonna um let's just kind of keep the idea skeletal right now we've hinted at it before but I think Ivo has worked out the bugs on this we're going to be doing some kind of live um online maybe once a month on a weeknight webinar for a select group of folks um, first come first serve so keep an eye out for that in the near very near future here um, we're going to be doing some case presentations you guys will all kind of just um, sign in and we'll just kind of have like a, a group lecture uh, just kind of open free talk and we'll be talking about you know a case or two and what we do with these things stuff that the average client isn't going to get here on the gate guys so that's kind of exciting plus a couple other things but one thing at a time here. We're just going to throw out a couple of carrots right now, just because, I don't know, it's Friday. I feel like it. It'll be great. Webinar format with screen sharing and basically lots of talk and lots of video. Being able to show things, and it'll be in a format where people can actually ask questions um, with screen sharing and uh, things like that. So uh, should be fairly fun, and we're hoping to have that up and running in June here. Um, at some point and uh, perhaps by the time this is out we'll have already done it once I don't know <laughs> yeah well I like the uh, I like the idea that you came up with because it's very kind of um, free and open and it allows us to go down rabbit holes that we can't do normally in lectures because of time slots and you know the number of slides you got to get through this will be we'll get through what we get through and if we go down some deep rabbit holes and some good concepts then then that's the day and uh, we'll, we'll get down the other stuff next time. But I'm excited about it because you and I tend to do better in these kind of free and open types of things where we can just talk and we can go anywhere we want with this stuff. Quite frequently, it ends in a good place, but uh, we'll see how we do. So keep your eyes open for that, folks. Uh, it will be uh, a limited number of people, at least at the beginning. So uh, don't him and haw over it if that's something you want to do. You make sure that you uh, sign up and, um, and, and become involved in it. So... so getting wordy here sorry about that it's friday and i'm excited because i love friday so let's get out of here uh we'll see you guys next time thanks for joining us as always hey don't forget if you're over there on um, itunes or wherever and there's an opportunity to give us a nice review or a thumbs up somewhere hey do that okay um we would do it for you and nothing needs to more needs to be said on that so every little bit helps so uh, uh until next time sean allen here in chicago I have a whirl up in Dillon, Colorado. We will see you in the shoe aisle.